Well, hello, my name is Dr. David Amron, and I'm uh, from Beverly Hills, California. I'm the founder and medical director of the Roxbury Institute, as you can see. And a few thank yous to get out of the way. Number one, I want to thank the FDRS for once again having me here, and Cheyenne for doing such a beautiful event. It gets better and better every year. I've been here, I think, the sixth year this, as I'm talking, and it's just a fifth year. Okay. It's a great, great event. Uh, Felicity for her work with Lymphedema Foundation to establish this as the disease that it should be recognized for, and then finally Karen Herbst for just being Karen Herbst. <laughs> but I actually want to, want to thank all of you for, for being here because it's actually right now happy hour, and we should, most of us having a drink, right? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to talk this year about, I also to make my talk a little bit educational, and this year I decided I'm going to talk about fibrosis because I felt it was an under, kind of appreciated thing. Patients many times ask, what is fibrosis? Well, the first talk of today was Karen Herbst, mostly talking about fibrosis, although it was entitled that. But, so hopefully I'm going to add to that. I, I, I still have no disclosures. One of my goals in life to eventually have a disclosure, but I still have none. Um, my experience um, and qualifications, I'm a board certified dermatologic surgeon since 1995. I've been in practice uh, then. It's, uh, since I've been in practice, my whole practice has basically been focused on liposuction surgery. It's the only surgery that I do, all different aspects of it. It quickly got into a lot of complicated stuff. Um, and in the last 15 or more years, um, I've been doing a lot of lipedema surgery. I've done over 2,000 surgeries in all those years, and now my practice is pretty much exclusively dedicated to lipedema. Um, I established a program at the Roxbury Institute to be more comprehensive. It's not just as we know about surgery. There's so many different aspects to lipedema treatment, and, and I'm trying to make it more of a comprehensive experience, from certainly diagnosis to some aspects of medical therapy to nutritional counseling. I had a naturopath, Dr. Sarah Whitney, who spoke here last year, uh, decongestive MLD therapy, which I finally brought in-house. Uh, of course, the liposuction surgery that I do, um, I have plastic surgeons that do the reconstructive surgery in those uh, patients that need lifting and tucking procedures, pre-op and post-op IV therapy, and then certain uh, targeted stem cell therapy in patients, either in their joints or in patients with high inflammatory markers. Um, I established the Lipedema Society a few years ago to increase awareness and education, uh, still trying to uh, always make that uh, uh, something that's happening. Um, so lipedema, um, and, and the term really is, is, is mostly what it is. It's, it's lip, which is fat, it's the Latin root of fat, and edema, which is swelling. And it was identified at the Mayo Clinic, a great paper written about it uh, way back when, 19, in, in actually 1940. Um, but I've always said this, and I think it, was, it did a, a disservice because it never got taken seriously, the term lipedema. It's like, what is this, lipedema? It sounds like a made up thing. It gets confused with lymphedema commonly. And I think it's contributed to why there's been such pervasive ignorance about this condition. So liposuction, surgery for lipedema is not the same as cosmetic liposuction. It's, it's liposuction, again, but there's certain aspects that are important to pay attention to that differentiate it. And insurance companies really should be paying attention to most of these things, too. Lipedema is a disease. The treatment must be done with a disease in mind rather than just only the cosmetic improvement. You're dealing with complicated areas. I mean, areas like the calves and ankles and forearms are areas that most surgeons would tend to avoid. Uh, well, lipedema is a circumferential disease. It, it really is. I mean, it wraps around the entire area. It's not just doing bits and pieces of it like in other aspects of cosmetic liposuction surgery. You want to treat the whole area completely, not only from a disease treatment for a cosmetic outcome. Um, patients, of course, tend to bleed and are prone to bleeding and bruising. Uh, increased susceptibility to DVTs in patients. Patients have many times hypercoagulable states and, and need to be uh, perioperatively anticoagulated. Uh, patients have reduced skin elasticity, another thing to deal with. Many patients have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or variations of it. Um, of course, it should be lymphatic sparing. We've talked about that. And the final thing is extensive fibrosis. I think to me, this is one of the big things that really differentiate the lipedema patients from your regular liposuction patients. They have a lot of fibrosis. What is fibrosis? Well, fibrosis is defined by the overgrowth, hardening, and or scarring of various tissues and is attributed to excess deposition of Extracellular matrix components, including collagen, fibrosis is the end result of chronic inflammatory reactions induced by a variety of stimuli, including persistent infections, autoimmune reactions, allergic responses, chemical insults, radiation, and tissue injury. Basically, fibrosis is scarring. It's scar tissue in that layer of fat. And this is from uh, Dr. Emily Eicher. Emily, are you in the audience? No, I don't think so. There she is. Hi, Emily. 
So Emily's in Los Angeles with me. We, we collaborate in a lot of patients, and she sent me some slides to demonstrate. Some, sometimes I'll send patients to her pre- or post-operatively to get an ultrasound, and this shows the sort of pancaking type, type of fibrosis you see in lipedema. And we've been surprised to see patients that many times have that fibrotic uh, band be as much as a centimeter thick. So I want to emphasize this is, this is my, my current state of knowledge of the pathophysiology of lipedema. So, and I'm, I'm being careful here because I know there's a lot of PhDs in the audience here that might um, have their own opinions. This is my opinion about what I think is going on. So it starts with, with certainly it's, 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 a, it's genetically inherited in almost all patients. It seems to be autosomal dominant where you have, you have a 50% chance of inheriting a gene directly from mother or the father. It starts with leaky lymphatics. There was some research presented in 2016 FDRS that, that was like an aha moment for me which showed leakiness of lymphatic walls where fluid is moving out into the surrounding tissues. We call it lymphorrhea. That lymphorrhea deposits fluid in the subcutaneous plane along with what's called stem cells that turn into preadipocytes. The preadipocytes start replicating mitotically. You get degeneration of the replicating fat cells. You incite a chronic inflammatory reaction, which is primarily macrophage. This is an interesting, this is an important thing. It's not primarily lymphocytes. It's not an autoimmune reaction primarily. And that leads to fibrosis. That can damage lymphatics, leading to lipolymphedema. And then you get increasing tissue congestion, increasing hydrostatic pressure, and a vicious cycle going on. So I'm going to predict that lipedema is primarily a collagen connective tissue disorder. And it was actually in 2016 that made me kind of realize that I text Karen Herbs. Karen, are you in the audience? I don't think so, right? And, and said, so I think that we're going to find that lipedema is a connective tissue disorder. And I really think that we are going to find primarily it's a systemic connective tissue disorder. And the fat is the after phenomenon of primarily what's going on. So it's important to pay attention to the fibrosis, which is connective tissue. That's scar tissue. Why do I say that? You have leaky lymphatics, collagen. You have capillary fragility, collagen. You have co common coexistence of Ehlers-Danlos, a connective tissue disorder. And finally, many patients have leaky gut syndrome. So just a suggestion down here, but it may not be a bad suggestion that lipedema might be called lipofibroedema because it, it also is a little more accurate in terms of what's going on. It's fat, it's swelling, but it's the fibrosis. I also think had we done that or if we do that, it's going to be paid more attention to by insurance companies as sounding like a disease. Consequences of increased fibrous tissue, increased pain and decreased mobility, increased co tissue congestion, lymphatic damage leading to lipolymphedema, decreased oxygenation to the skin, all the different skin changes you can see, stasis changes. Um, Stephen Dean did a good job talking about this. Increased risk of cellulitis, ulceration, loss of uh, hair and hyperpigmentation, and a lot of referred neurologic symptoms. I've seen a lot of patients diagnosed with peripheral neuropathy, plantar fasciitis, reflex sympathetic dystrophy that miraculously just goes away after you release all that fibrosis north of it. So, you know, I think there's a lot of misdiagnoses that go on that really are attributed to, to lipedema. There's been a lot of non-surgical approaches uh, to reduce fibrosis. They fall into different categories, decongestive stuff, uh, MLD therapy. Uh, Karen's talked about quadribus therapy, compression certainly, a lot of different dietary strategies, RAD diet, ketogenic diet, a lot of different supplements have been shown to be helpful, anti-inflammatory things. Of course, exercise and things like the fascia blaster externally also. Um, the goals for lipedema surgery, um, and Durkham's too, I, I think this is a slide from last year, the year before, you should get maximum disease treatment and symptom reduction and prevention. It should be done in a lymphatic sparing way. Of course, fat reduction is important, removing as much fat as you can, um, but also the maximum decongestion of fibrous tissue. It's a very important goal of the surgery. I think it's actually as important as, as the fat removal, how you're releasing and, and decongesting the, the fibrosis. And patients can, can you know, be on a spectrum. Is, some patients are almost all functional disease treatment. If they're stage three, stage four, they're having a hard time walking, certainly. And other patients, stage one and two, only care about cosmetic stuff. But you really should be maximizing both in patients. Um, this is uh, a little joke here. But I, I think that we should really develop a fiber scale for lipidin. We like to grade things. We grade the disease itself. We really should be grading the, 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 the fibrosis um, on a scale of 1 to 10, whatever. So we should develop a fiber scale. Um, and Emily, I want to talk to you about this because I think it will be an important thing to, to develop. I think it's a combination of external uh, diagnostic things. And a lot, of times, you know, a lot of times you really don't know as much until you actually are physically in there and you're, you're hitting into all that fibrosis. 
And I tell patients, some patients are soft and soft, fluffy fat, and some patients are rock hard and have a lot of fibrous tissue to be, be releasing. Benefits of maximally decongestive liposuction surgery, this healthy tissue remodeling that goes on, improved lymphatic flow, decrease in symptoms and pain and swelling, um, improvement of the coexisting diseases I talked about that probably were misdiagnoses, and success of varicose vein treatments. Um, this has been something that, that gets talked about a lot, should be done before or after the surgery. And there's different strategies. I actually think that it's better to do the liposuction surgery first and decongest and release. And then most likely, most of those varicose vein treatments afterwards are going to be more successful because you're reducing all that congestion, hydrostatic pressure that may make those varicose vein treatments less successful. Uh, my approach, what I, what I do in my practice, so I, I do in a surgical center, um, I can use general anesthesia. This is a long discussion I'm not going to get into. I really don't like to for a number of reasons from not only safety, recovery, but really results. Lipo is a very different sort of surgery. Positioning to me is extremely important. General anesthesia is a technical disadvantage, so I do it in two ways. They're both versions of tumescent local anesthesia. Uh, about 60 to 70% of patients are with, uh, with mild station without an anesthesiologist. 30 to 40% are with an anesthesiologist uh, under what's called twilight or monitor anesthesia care. Anatomic approach, I do do 90% of my uh, patients circumferentially, uh, but I determine which ones should be done circumferentially, which ones should not be. This is an important long discussion also. I think the patients that are stage three, stage four, a lot of fibrosis will not handle a circumferential approach because of congestion tools. Again, long discussion. I hate to get into this too much. I start by using wall, but primarily to hydrolyze sect and to mess. I do use vaser and artery patient. I do like what it does in terms of further releasing fibrosis. Um, and emulsifying the fat. I, I only use laser in Durkham's patients. I talked about this a few years ago uh, for this high peak energy and temperature. Uh, I sometimes will use body tight for further additional tightening, and I use power liposuction. I do an average of two surgeries uh, for complete correction, four or more weeks apart. Some compulsory or, or custom made before and after photographs that are out there too. Uh, this is a, a slide I had last year showing the different modalities and my feelings about how they are in all the different areas of fibrous release, emulsification, skin tightening, cellular reduction, and the nodules themselves. And you kind of see I grade them on one to five stars. Goals for lipidemia as a disease, we need to increase awareness and decrease the pervasive ignorance. And ignorance does not mean stupidity, it's just being ignored. Number two, we have to increase diagnosis. We should be training pediatricians and primary care practitioners, diagnosing earlier so we can prevent these patients from advancing. Increase in identifying patients like we just talked about. Uh, increase in the preventative strategies themselves, compression protocols, uh, hormonal manipulations, dietary strategies, a lot of the diagnostic tools we need to be using more. Increase in basic science and clinical research. Well, this is starting to really happen. It's, it's getting very exciting so we can substantiate this as a disease. Uh, increase in qualified, trained, dedicated lipidema surgeons. Um, I, I'm highly supportive of more people doing this. I really think people have to be really dedicated. They can't just dabble in lipidema surgery. It's very complicated stuff. They have to have a heart for it. Excuse me. They have to have a heart for it and a dedication to this as a disease. It's, it's, it's a complicated uh, condition to, to do surgery on. And of course, finally, increase in insurance coverage. That is a very important goal for, for all of us. Um, this is my compulsory contact information. And I want to thank you.